Psalm chapter 100, there are five verses, so let's read all five verses together this morning in this short passage. Good Psalm chapter 100, read together with me please. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Our Heavenly Father, I just ask you now to meet with us and help me now to be what my people need. I thank you, Lord, for this time of year. I thank you, Lord, for this church family. I thank you, Lord, for your sweet goodness that you've shown to us. Bless, I pray, with your wonderful presence during these few moments that we will spend together this morning. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to try not to keep you long this morning, but you know what that means. Same thing it means when a preacher takes his watch off and lays it on the pulpit. It means nothing at all. And so I'm going to do my best not to keep you for very long because I have one thought that I want to give you today, and I want you to listen very, very carefully. And I've, I, I couldn't come up with a creative title, and I, I say that not jokingly. I say that very seriously. I couldn't come up with a creative title, so I just named it Developing a Grateful Heart. Developing a Grateful Heart. I want you to notice again the words, if you would please, in verse 4, where it says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise, and be thankful unto him, and bless his name. Dr. Bob Jones Sr., he said this, and I quote, The loveliest flower that blooms in the garden of the heart is the flower of gratitude. And when gratitude dies on the altar of a man's heart, he is well nigh gone. End quote. That's such a truth. Bob Jones Sr. had a great deal of wisdom. Been in heaven now for many, many years. Romans chapter 1 and verse 21, the word of God says, it speaks about this. It says, when, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. And then the next phrase in there, it says, neither were thankful. Neither were thankful, be, became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. I think it's interesting that God would include that little phrase, neither were thankful. It was part of their fall. They did not have a gracious heart. They did not have a thankful heart. Everything was a, everything was a, uh, was a task, nothing to be thankful for. No one likes to be around an unthankful individual. I know I don't. I'd avoid them like they got the plague. I don't want to be near someone who's unthankful. Why? Because everything they do, it spoils everything around them if they don't have a grateful heart. According to Romans chapter 1, ingratitude leads to many unspeakable sins against God, against men, and against themselves. And God eventually... Uh, as I read through this passage, we're not going to go to Romans 1 and read all the things that are there. But because of this, this ungrateful heart, this unthankful heart, not remembering God in their thoughts, it led, it, God gave them up to uncleanness and gave them up to vile affections. And the Bible says he gave them over to re reprobate minds. It's a downhill slide. And you know, a lot of sermons are preached out of Romans chapter 1 on the sins of the flesh that are mentioned there. But I don't want to major on those things. I want to major on what led them to that was a heart of ingratitude, you see. There are many sins that we commit today that are the result of a lack of genuine gratitude in our hearts. I don't think anybody can argue with that. I say that emphatically. The fact that men today live with ingratitude in their hearts leads to many types of sin, many types of unspeakable things that we'll not go into this morning. A lack of gratitude. You've met them. I've met them too. People that are not thankful. Everything is a, everything is a burden. They're not thankful for anything. What have I got to be thankful for? I've seen it over the years in testimony times and even had it said to me, though I'm glad I don't remember who it was that said it to me. 
because I think if I remembered who it was, I would be embittered in my heart toward that individual. But they have said to me in times past, uh, well, what have I got to be thankful for? What do I have to testify about? I don't have anything to testify about. I'm glad I don't remember a single name of any individual who ever said anything like that to me. But yes, I remember that it has been said. But where I want to major today is this, is how do you develop a, a gracious heart? How do you develop a, a grateful heart? How do you develop that, that thankfulness? You know, there's books been written. I mean, you can go to the library and you can check out all kinds of material. You can go to a Christian bookstore and they're all over and there's going to be an, probably an entire section on thankfulness or gratitude. And people will read those books and they'll come up with, did you know the Bible has the answer to it? I mean, just the word of God. Not what someone wrote about the Word of God, but actually what the Word of God has to say. It tells us how to develop a grateful heart. And it's very, very simple. In fact, please don't fire me because it's such a simple truth. But I think sometimes we overlook the simplicity in Scripture, always looking for something else to help us out. So how do you do that? Look, if you would, please. How do you develop it? James chapter 1 and verse 17. If you'll take your Bible and go there, this is the secret. And it's no secret at all because it's been in the Bible the whole time, right there in front of our eyes. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the secret to developing a gracious heart. How is that the secret? Did you see what it said? Let me read it again. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. How many Christians today have walked away from that not realizing that everything in their life that has been a blessing to them comes from God. I've written down a few points, and I want you to listen very carefully. Number one, when you realize that everything you have comes from the Lord, then you're going to feel gratitude in your heart. Nobody pulls themselves up by their bootstraps. As I said earlier, nobody is a self-made man. Nobody is. Nobody is an island unto themselves. You must realize that everything that you have comes from him. There's an old saying that says, if you bought it, a truck brought it. I remember when I first saw that and I thought to myself, you know, that's true. Even the farmer who planted his original seeds, he probably bought them at a feed store or some kind of a, a place where you could buy seeds so that he could plant it. And then after that, he planted his own seed, but it came on a truck from somewhere. But if you bought it, a truck brought it. Very, very true statement. And thankful for all of our truck drivers. And oh, how I mean that with all my heart. Everything that I am wearing and everything that I have right now came on a truck at one time. But let's just change that phrase a little bit. The truth is, if you have it, the Lord provided it. If you have it, the Lord provided it. And you can't name anything that God did not provide. And sometimes he did it in an unexpected way. And sometimes he used an individual to bring that to you, to be a blessing to you or whatever it might be. And maybe uh, uh, you've looked at that and thought, well, thank that individual. You ought to be thanking God. Why? Because he's the one who brought it to you. If you have it, God provided it. From the breakfast you had this morning uh, to the lunch you may have this afternoon. We're having hot dogs this afternoon, aren't we? glory. There's not much in the whole world better than a hot dog. I say, how do you like your hot dogs? Anyway, when I grew up, a hot dog bun was a piece of Kroger bread rolled around a hot dog. Maybe some of you grew up the same way. But we're having hot dogs today for lunch. Doesn't that sound good to you? I like mine like Babe Ruth liked his. How did Babe Ruth like his hot dogs? He had a hot dog. He put yellow mustard on it and chopped onions. That's how I like my hot dogs. And you can, I mean, I like chili and I like cheese and I like the little peppers and I like all those things. But if I'm going to make a hot dog, what do I do? It's yellow mustard and chopped onions. The lunch you're going to have this afternoon, perhaps the snack you may have after you get home from church tonight, 
You've got to realize the Lord provided that. That's why you should always bow your head before you have a meal and say, thank you, Lord, for providing this for me. There are people around the world that would give anything to have what you're probably going to scrape off of your plate today. But yet you had what you had by God's provision. Oh, how the Lord has abundantly blessed you. No matter how simple your meal is, and no matter how basic your clothing is, uh, no matter how inexpensive the things that you wear are, the, the Lord has been gracious. And when you realize that God has provided all of it, look what the verse says. It says it plainly, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. It's all there. And then people get bitter. Well, God hadn't provided much for me and I don't have all that much. Listen, you got more than most of the world has. And the fact that you're sitting here today you have your health, what little bit or much of it there may be, I don't know. But I'm here to tell you, God has been gracious to all of us. And realizing that it came down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variables, God does not change. And oh, the blessings that come, realize everything comes from him. I told you the story a while back, but I want to give it a little bit different perspective if I may. I was with my dad a number of years ago and we wanted to go someplace and he, and he drove by, I was there, I think it was for pastor school or something. He wanted to go for a quick drive. He pulled into the bank, he put his card in, pulled out $300 in 20s and handed it to me and said, I want you to go buy some shoes. Did my dad provide that? He sure did. But that good gift came down from the Father above. Thanking the Lord for that. Are you, do you realize how good the Lord is? Everything comes from him. Well, if you bought it, a truck brought it, but if you have it, the Lord provided it. Secondly, a man can never be genuinely thankful until he recognizes where the things he possesses came from. I mean, look in your possession. What do you own? You go back to your house this afternoon, look in the closet and see all those clothes. Look in your drawers and see all the different things that are folded and put in there. We had a girl in our youth group many years ago. It was so sweet. I love this illustration because her dad was my good friend and I appreciated it so much. And the daughter said, I want to buy a, I want you to buy me a sweater. He said, you've got more sweaters than you can wear. And, she's, and he's, she said, but I would like another sweater. And he said, so help me. He said, if you have less than 50 sweaters, he said, I will buy you another one. She had 49. 49 sweaters folded up in drawers. Can you believe that? What girl? How do you wear 49 sweaters? I mean, there's only 52 weeks in a year. And uh, not all those weeks are worthy of a sweater. You hear what I'm saying? He bought her a sweater. Amazing thing. And uh, I, when I think about that, you realize where it all comes from. It comes from the Lord. The same man one night, uh, we got back from soul winning and went into the church kitchen and sat down on the counter where you're not supposed to sit and sat down on the counter. He went and got out of the freezer two fudge sickles. A fudge sickle. That was before I was allergic to chocolate. And uh, we're standing there, and he says, I got a problem, Pastor Dan. And I'm thinking, I know you do. You got a daughter that wants 50 sweaters. And uh, he said, I've got a problem, Pastor Dan. I need your help. I said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, he said, I sold a house, and I've got all this money. And he says, I don't know what to do with it, so I'd like to buy you a car. I said, let me pray about it. Yes. <laughs> Doesn't take long to pray about something like that. To make a long story short, he ended up purchasing for us an automobile, which was nice. And we drove it till we drove the wheels off of it. Just an amazing thing. So did, say, did he provide that? Yes, he did. But where did it come from? It was the Lord that prompted his heart to do something with that money that he, that he got from selling a house. You know, Johnson Oatman, he penned these words. Now listen carefully with that in mind, okay? He said, when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one. But here's the, here's the phrase, listen to it, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. I think sometimes we sing this song not even thinking about it. it's what the Lord hath done, you see. Then he goes on to write, count your, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what? God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, 
And it will surprise you, what's the next phrase? What the Lord hath done get all bitter at the Lord over, over not having what somebody else has. Shame on us. Shame on us over jealousy, over uh, seeing what someone else owns. We see others with their houses and their lands and all that. And then we get to think about the little bit that we might have realized that the Lord has provided everything that you need, perhaps not everything that you want. We don't have a name it, claim it, blab it, grab it kind of a Christianity. Thank God we don't. But the truth of the matter is, we have a God who has provided for us. It's what the Lord hath done. It's what the Lord hath done. You folks here this morning, you're going to get in your car and drive home. You've got a car. You've got a car. I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, videos that uh, people that I don't know have posted on, on different things on Facebook. They don't even have a chair to sit in. They don't have a bed to sleep on. They don't have anything, but yet we have more than we can imagine, and the Lord has provided. Look and see what the Lord hath done. Count your many blessings. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God hath done. Count your blessings. Name them ton by ton. Count your many blessings. See what God hath done. So first of all, realize that everything you have comes from the Lord. Secondly, you can never be genuinely thankful till you realize that. You have to understand it comes from the Lord. It comes from the Lord. I rarely, when I sit down at a meal, um, I, I, when I sit down, I will rarely ask God to bless the food. I'm hoping it's not going to kill me anyway. Okay? And then there's always, Lord, bless those hands that, prepared it those mysterious hands you know the that sort of float around and all that but when I sit down at a meal I say Lord thank you for your provision thank you thank you for providing this meal that's why these days I try to always work for a clean plate award do you do that I try to always go for the clean plate award I say what is that that's the award you get for cleaning your plate and not leaving food on it to be thrown away. That's the Lord's provision, you see. But there's a third thing, and that's this, is we, often, we all too often forget. We all too often forget. What am I talking about? The psalmist reminds us in Psalm 103 and verse 2. Look what it says. And if you have your Bible there, it's not going to take you long to get over there from Psalm 100. But Psalm 103 and verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. <laughs> I think we forget, don't we? We forget so many things. When I think about remembering and, I, uh, and remembering on purpose, it's not a matter of not forgetting. It's a matter of remembering on purpose. I think about how my salvation is from the Lord. You know, of all the people in the entire world that God could have saved on February the 16th, 1964, he saved me. That, you know, listen, I know I share my testimony a lot. I realize that. I realize that my children probably know my testimony better than I do. One of these days when I'm old and decrepit and can't remember anything, they're going to remember when I got saved. And they're going to remember uh, Ben Conrad. And they're going to remember Bill Kellogg. And they're going to remember Bob Humphreys. And they're going to remember Faith Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. They're going to remember February 16th, 1964. They're going to remember those things. I might not be able to remember it, but they will. But you hear me all the time proclaim and exclaim my salvation. You have never met a man more grateful for salvation than the one you're looking at right now. And I don't care how many times I share it. And I, I don't mind if somebody, you all would never do it, but I'm sure somebody in the times past has done it. And they say, oh, it was February, I'll never forget it. It was on a Sunday night on February the 16th, 19th. Here he goes again. That's right, here I go again. And I'm going to share it till the day that I die. I, I, I had to preach a funeral in Minnesota. I was asked to do it. And I had to meet with the family. I didn't know the family. It was some people that I'd never met, but they needed a preacher to come and do the funeral. And their son had gotten killed on a motorcycle accident. And so I got with the parents and I says, do you know if your son knew the Lord? Do you know if he was saved? And they said, we don't know. 
I said, do you have a Sunday school certificate of any kind saying where you attended Sunday school? I mean, I had one. Um, Mrs. Conrad was my, was my junior church teacher when I was a little boy. And they said, no. I said, does he have a baptism certificate anywhere? That's why we print baptism certificates when somebody gets baptized so that they've got it. And if they lose it, I can print up another one, you know, because we don't want people to forget. Does he have a baptism certificate? No. Does, does he have a Bible? Didn't have a Bible. Is there anything written in anybody's Bible? I said, in my mom's Bible, uh, she wrote down, Danny Parton got saved February 16th, 1964. They said nothing. Had no idea whether or not their son was born again. One of the hardest funerals I've ever preached in my life. I'm thankful for my salvation, and I don't mind letting the world know. Over and over and, oh no, he's going to share his testimony again. I don't mind it. Let him say it. At least I talk about it. And every year, we celebrate spiritual birthdays when my children were all at home. We'd celebrate spiritual birthdays six times a year. It was really great because everybody got to pick their favorite dessert. And no matter what it was, they, we would have their favorite dessert. We'd all go around the table sharing our salvation testimony six times a year because there were six of us. So my testimony got heard six times and Robin's testimony got heard six times and all the children's testimonies got heard six times. And then we enjoyed a great dessert. Someone said to me a number of years ago, and I, I do remember who it was. They sat right over here. And uh, came up to me after a service one time and said, we've never been in a church ever where people shared when they got saved as they do in this church. And I thought, wow, what a shame that is. What a shame that is. It just makes me want to have more testimonies about, I listen, somebody says, well, I don't have a whole lot to share this month. Well, you got saved, didn't you? You can share that. I got saved. Blah, blah, blah. Tell me about it. Tell me you were there when it happened, weren't you? That's what I mean. I think about something else we all too often forget. My existence on this earth I owe to the Lord. You realize I'm alive today by the grace of God and so are you. I was communicating with Brother Penn the other day and, and uh, December is one of those traumatic months for all of us around here. <laughs> it was, uh, how many years ago was it? December of 2005 that I had a heart attack. Oh. That was a good effort, folks. I'm proud of you. Uh, had that, and then uh, it was uh, the diagnosis with colorectal cancer, and then later on it was uh, it was all kinds of stuff. And we kept to thinking about that, and I said to Brother Penn in my communication, I said, "Well, it is coming up on December, don't you know?" It's like, "Oh no, oh no." Well, I'm here by the grace of God, and by the way, you are too. Every person here is here by God's grace. I mean, there may be those days you're only half here. But you're here nonetheless. I mean, you woke up this morning. Some of you barely, but you woke up this morning. Uh, some of you will go to bed tonight, and you may or may not go to sleep when you want to go to sleep. But your existence is, listen, I owe the Lord my existence, the fact that I am here. And I'm not sorry I was born. I'm thanking God that God let me be born to my parents. Something else, I think about my calling in life, my calling into the ministry. I was just a 17-year-old teenager, and when Tom Wallace preached, oh, there's that testimony about Tom Wallace preaching. Yeah, I'm going to share it again. And I was 17 years of age, and I'll just never forget after he preached that night that I went forward in my own church, and I knelt down at the altar on my left and your right, and I wrote God a spiritual check, and I said, Lord, I don't know what you have for me, but you're getting all of me. And I wrote him a spiritual check, signed it, and let him fill in the blank. What, say, what was that? That was a surrender. But it wasn't until my second year in college that God gave me a calling. And I remember rolling off of my bunk uh, in the middle of the afternoon. And why I was there in the middle of the afternoon, I don't know. But I remember it was a sunny day. I rolled off of my bunk onto my knees, and I said, Lord, I will do it. And that was my calling. I'm thanking to God for that. I'm thanking the Lord for that, that through these years that he's never gone back on it, and neither have I. Everything that I am and possess is because of the Lord. Everything. Everything. Which is one of the reasons that I'm such a grateful individual today, and I want you to be grateful as well. It was, listen, after he had attended a preaching service in Germany, songwriter Bill Tyner, uh, he 
turn to what he described in his own writings as a fair, blonde, young German lad with the brightest blue eyes that he had ever seen. And he asked this young man, he said, Son, what does Jesus mean to you? What does Jesus mean to you? That young man looked at him and said, He is my everything. He is my everything. And that inspired Mr. Tyner to write the chorus that my youth director taught me when I was just a teenager and the ones that we sing here. Bill Tyner said that it made such an impression on him that he went back to his hotel that evening and he wrote the words that we sing today. Some folks may ask me, some folks may say, who is this Jesus that you talk about every day? He is my Savior. He set me free. Now listen while I tell you what he's done for me. He is my everything. He is my all. He is my everything, both great and small. He gave his life for me, made everything new. He is my everything. Now how about you? A grateful heart. Listen, every one of us have more things to complain about than we can shake a stick at in the month of Sundays, and you know that's true. We do. We got all kinds of things we can complain about. You can sit down and I, I, I challenged you on Wednesday to take the back of your little songbook and write on those lines things that you were thankful for. You could take the same kind of a thing and write down on those same lines things you want to complain about. And they're all justifiable. None of us live perfect lives. None of us have lives that don't have problems and difficulties that come our way and things that we don't understand. None of us live that kind of a life. We all have things that we could complain about. But I don't want to live a life complaining and begrudging every day getting out of the bed and begrudging we got to go to church and I got to work a job and I got to do this and I have to pay the bills and I've got to put up with this and I have to put up with that. I don't want to live that kind of a life. But realizing what James said, everything comes from God. Be thankful. I read about a fellow who wanted to get rid of his home. <laughs> I, I reread this illustration. I had to reshare it with you, okay? And Robin was in real estate as a real estate assistant for a lot of years. And so she can appreciate this. But he had a friend who was a real estate agent. So she, he called him and said, I want to run an ad in the paper to sell my home. Get rid of it as quickly as you can. I'm tired of this old place. And the real estate agent said, well, tell me something about your home so I can run a good ad. Well, the, old, the man told him how many rooms it had, it had carpet, he told him about the shrubs in the yard and how expensive they were, and he told him about the fruit trees in the backyard. I, I can relate to that. When I was growing up, my dad put three fruit trees in the backyard. Uh, two of them got blown down by, by, flat, by level winds that blew in the backyard, but there was one that remained up, you see. And, um, and so anyway, he uh, described the home in detail so the realtor could sell it. He says, I'll read it back to you and you tell me how it sounds. Well, he read the ad about this beautiful three-bedroom home with two baths, a good uh, strand of grass in the yard and the fruit trees in the backyard, a new roof put on last year, central air conditioning put in, remodeled uh, carport that held two cars. He kept on reading until the, the owner stopped him and said these words. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, stop. He said, that house is not for sale. He said, all my life I've wanted a place like that, but I didn't realize that I had one until you read the ad. Doesn't that sound like us? Yeah. Yeah. Read it back to him, and he wanted to keep his home. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Now, go back, if you would, please, to Psalm 100. And I, I told you I wasn't going to keep you long th this morning, and I'm not going to. But Psalm 100 and verse 4, it says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise, and be thankful unto him, and bless his name. Sounds to me like you can bless his name by coming to God with thanksgiving in your heart, don't you think? Dr. Bob Jones Sr., you remember what he said? Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said, the loveliest flower that blooms in the garden of the heart is the flower of gratitude. And when gratitude dies on the altar of a man's heart, he is well nigh gone. And then we read out of Romans chapter 1, 
were the, those three little words, neither were thankful. Part of that which led to unspeakable wrongs and ungrateful heart. What we need to do is determine to cultivate an attitude of gratitude in our hearts lest we become well nigh gone. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Thank you for the wisdom that you shared with us. Thank you so very, very much. Been in heaven for a long time. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. was a very wise man and a very good old-timey preacher. But he said the greatest flower in that heart is that of gratitude. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you.